Hello. In the videos prior to this one, we have introduced the general formalism of statistical mechanics. In those videos, we introduced the notion of a microstate and said how we can thus reconcile a microscopic description in terms of the positions and momentums of all the individual atoms and molecules in our system with the macroscopic extensive thermodynamic variables that appear in classical thermodynamics. One of the key tools that we have introduced in doing so has been the notion of a statistical thermodynamic ensemble. We have discussed the canonical NVT ensemble in depth elsewhere, and have learnt that if a system has a constant number of atoms, a constant volume, and a constant temperature, then the probability of being in each of the microstates is given by the formula shown at the top of this slide. In addition, we have introduced the canonical partition function, which is calculated using the formula shown at the bottom of this slide. The partition function is important as we have seen that the thermodynamic potential and various ensemble averages can be calculated from this quantity directly. Furthermore, we have seen that statistical mechanics relates the heat capacity to a second derivative of the partition function, and that this second derivative is related to the fluctuations in the energy. We have thus seen that the probabilistic formalism of statistical mechanics is fully consistent with the second law of thermodynamics. In this video, and the remainder of the videos in this course, we are going to learn how to apply the statistical mechanical framework we have developed to model Hamiltonians. This, as we will see, will allow us to make a connection between what we observe for macroscopic systems and the inter- and intramolecular forces that act between the constituent particles from which these macroscopic systems are composed. As you might expect, calculating the canonical partition function using the expression shown at the bottom of this slide will be central in many of the examples I will go through. The mathematical equations involved can look pretty horrendous because of the particular details of the problem. It is thus very important that you work through all the derivations yourself and make sure you are comfortable with the way that various symbols are used in these proofs. In other words, you may need to make sure you understand what the various terms in the equations that appear in the slides that follows represent in the physical systems. As you do this, though, you need to remember what precisely we have to do to calculate the partition function. We need to have a Hamiltonian that we can use to calculate the energy of a microstate, and we need to perform the following sum over microstates. Much of the complexity in the equations that follow will become because the Hamiltonians for our model systems are reasonably complex and because B summing over all the microstates is a little involved. In the slides that follow, I will thus colour code the equations for the partition function. The parts in red will be used to denote the parts of the equation that are summing over the various microstates, while the parts of the equation due to the Hamiltonian will be shown in blue, as shown here. Before we get on to calculating a partition function for an actual system, it is worth dwelling for a moment on the various model systems that we will consider. When I think about the four types of model systems we will look at, I like to use the following matrix in order to classify them. The first distinction we must make between model systems concerns whether the particles of which the system is com are composed lie on a lattice, like the atoms in a solid, or whether the atoms are more free to move about, like the atoms in a gas. We then must decide whether our model will incorporate the interactions between the particles. Obviously, in reality, there are no systems in which atoms do not interact. Having said that, though, the maths is much more straightforward if we assume that there are no interactions between particles. Furthermore, there are cases where this turns out to be not be a completely terrible assumption. Consequently, in this first video, we are going to consider a model system in this part of our matrix. 
the particles in this system will lie in a lattice and they will not interact with each other. The Hamiltonian for the system we are about to study is shown in blue on this slide here. This Hamiltonian is frequently used to model spins interacting with an applied magnetic field. As such, mu is the magnetic dipole moment of a single spin, and h is the magnetic field strength. These quantities can both be thought of as parameters. I stated at the outset that we are going to consider the canonical ensemble, but we are not really here studying a system with a constant number of atoms, a constant volume and a constant temperature. In fact, only the number of particles and the temperature are constant as it, may, it makes little sense to talk about the volume of this particular system of magnetic spins. What we are really doing is operating in an NHT ensemble, in which the magnetic field strength is fixed, and the magnetic field strength plays the role of a volume. Probably most physicists would call this a canonical ensemble, even though the volume is not fixed. What can I say? We like to use the nomenclature in a way that will best confuse students. The values of the SI terms in this Hamiltonians are the only things that depend on the particular microstate that the system finds itself in. Each of these SI terms tells us whether a particular spin is aligned against the magnetic field, in this case it is said to be spin down, or whether it is aligned with the magnetic field, in which case it is said to be spin up. Notice also that we have n spins in total, so we have to specify n SI values, each of which, which can take one of two values, spin up or spin dip down. This is why there is a sum at the start of this expression. We have to sum the contribution each spin makes to the total energy of the system. Notice next that only one spin value appears in each of the terms in the summation that makes up the Hamiltonian. Only one spin value appears in each of these terms because the spins do not interact. There are thus no terms in the Hamiltonian that are a function of a pair of spins, or any terms that are a function of multiple spins for that matter. Having confirmed that we have correctly incorporated the fact that this is a non-interacting model into the Hamiltonian, we now need to consider how the other important factor that we discussed in the introduction, the fact that this is a lattice model, enters the model. What it is critical to understand in this case is that when any spin or spins are flipped, the microstate the system finds itself in is changed. Thus, the new configuration we move to here is a new microstate, even though the total number of spin-up states is unchanged. The fact that these two states are different is easy to remember, though, when one remembers that each particle is fixed on its lattice site. This new microstate is different to the previous one because the lower left spin and lower right spins po point in the opposite directions to the directions they pointed in in the previous configuration. It is as straightforward as that. Having discussed the Hamiltonian for this particular system, let's now move to the second thing we need to do in order to calculate the partition function. As discussed in the introduction, we need to perform the sum over microstates. If we have a single spin, this is relatively simple. The single spin can be in one of two states, spin up or spin down. We thus need to perform a single sum over the two possible values for this one spin variable, as shown here. Now suppose that we have two spins. The system can be in one of four states. Up, 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 down, down, up, and or down, down. Remember that the up-down microstate differs from the down-up microstate as the spins are on a lattice. There are thus four possible microstates, and we can sum over these four microstates by performing the double sum 
over two individual spin variables shown here. Now suppose that we have three spins. There are now eight distinct microstates that the system can be in, which are listed here. Furthermore, we can sum over these eight distinct microstates by performing the triple sum of the three spin variables S1, S2 and S3, as shown here. We can generalise this in type we get by considering systems of 1, 2 and 3 spins by recognising that if we have n spins, we have 2 to the n microstates in total. To calculate the partition function, we will have to do a sum over n spin variables. We can use the symbol shown at the bottom right of this slide to illustrate that the sum that we will ultimately have to perform in this case. Let's now insert the sum over microstates of the system and the Hamiltonian we have introduced into our expression for the canonical partition function. Notice that, as I promised, I will keep all parts to do with the sum over microstates in red and all parts to do with the Hamiltonian in blue in the final expression in order to maintain some clarity. The final expression we arrive at is shown here. It looks a bit horrendous, but it's hopefully easy enough to understand if you remember that it is composed of the sum over all microstates and the Hamiltonian that we have just introduced. I like to use the function z to map the numbers in the sum, which are 0 and 1, onto the spin values minus 1 and plus 1, as shown here. In some textbooks, you will see them write the sum from minus 1 to plus 1 directly. I can't help feeling this is wrong, as in going from minus 1 to plus 1 in steps of 1, you have to go through 0. Here is the expression that we just arrived at for the partition function once more at the top of this slide. Let's now see if we can simplify this expression somewhat. The first step in doing so is to recognise that the exponential of the sum that appears at the end of the expression can be rewritten as a product of exponentials. In doing this manipulation, we simply exploit well-known properties of the exponential function. The next thing to note is that each of the terms in the product depends on one and only one of the spin variables in the sum. We can thus rewrite the expression for the partition function as shown here. Now note that each of these summations are identical. We can thus rewrite the product of simulations of summations as the following power. Furthermore, remembering that z of s1 can only equal minus 1 or plus 1 allows us to expand the sum as shown here. We immediately recognise this sum of two integrals as the hyperbolic cosine of beta mu h. The partition function for this system of lattice spins is thus simply equal to 2 to the n cosh beta mu h all raised to the power n as shown here. The value of the canonical partition function is, in and of itself, not particularly useful. The function for the partition function is of enormous use, however, because we can derive an analytical expression for the average energy from it, and we can also derive the equation of state for the system by taking appropriate partial derivatives. For this system of spins, the equation of state will be an expression that allows one to calculate the average magnetization of the system from the temperature and the applied magnetic field. I will leave the derivation of that expression to one of the exercises and will instead focus here on deriving an expression for the average energy as a function of the temperature and applied magnetic field, H. To derive this expression, we must recall that the ensemble average of the energy is equal to minus the derivative of psi with respect to beta, and that psi is equal to the logarithm of the partition function. When we insert our expression for the partition function into this equation and perform some simple manipulations using the logarithm, we find the derivative that we have to calculate is as follows. The first term here is a constant, so clearly its derivative is equal to zero. 
The derivative of the second term, by contrast, can be found by exploiting the chain rule and what we know about the derivatives of the logarithm and the derivatives of the hyperbolic cosine. The final result for the average energy is shown here. Furthermore, this expression could be simplified by remembering that if we take the shine of a number and divide it by the hyperbolic cosine, we get the hyperbolic tangent of that number, as shown here. It is worth dwelling for a moment on what this expression tells us about how the spins behave as the temperature is changed. In the graph shown here, the blue line shows the dependence of the average energy on beta. Remember, beta is equal to 1 over kT, so moving leftwards on this figure corresponds to increasing the temperature. When beta is large, that is to say when the temperature is small, the average energy saturates at a value of minus n mu h. By remembering the Hamiltonian for this system, we can make a deduction about the behaviour of all the spins in the low temperature limit, from the fact that the energy saturates at low temperature. In essence, we can deduce that all the spins must be aligned with the magnetic field as shown here. They must be aligned with the magnetic field as the energy is minimised when all the spins point in the same direction of the, as the field. The fact that the energy increases as the temperature is increased suggests that as the temperature is increased, some of the spins start to flip and become aligned against the prevailing field, as shown here. In the high temperature limit, i.e. when beta is equal to zero, the energy is equal to zero, suggesting that on average in this limit, the number of spin-up particles equals the number of spin-down particles. To conclude then, we have used the tools of statistical mechanics to study a system composed of non-interacting spins sitting on a lattice and interacting with a magnetic field. There are no interactions between these spins, so it is thus relatively straightforward to derive an expression for the canonical partition function for this system. The partition function can be calculated using the expression shown here. This equation is useful because we can derive an expression for the ensemble average of the energy for the system from it by taking appropriate partial derivatives of it. Furthermore, as you will see in the exercises, we can also derive expressions for the equation of state from this partition function. In the final part of this video, we discussed how we can infer how the spins are behaving as the system changed by looking at this expression for the average energy. In particular, we saw how at low temperatures, all the spins are aligned with the magnetic field, while at high temperatures, the number of spin-up particles is equal on average to the number of spin-down particles. The mathematics we have used in this video is not particularly difficult, but the equations can look rather ferocious because they have large numbers of terms. I would thus strongly recommend trying some problems on this material before moving on. You can find example problems by following the link here. Thank you for your attention.